In Australia, as in many other parts of the world, where horses are still used to work cattle and sheep, situations can exist which require horses to work in difficult, even dangerous conditions. Here in the New England district of New South Wales, Australia, cattle and sheep are often grazed in country which some people would call inaccessible. Certainly modern technology has caught up with the horse and in many cases overtaken it. Yet there are many instances where in doing this kind of work, horses are unbeatable. The horses used in this program are all Australian stock horses, which are particularly suited to this kind of work. They also excel in many other activities, such as polo, camp drafting, dressage, jumping and eventing. The documented history of the Australian horse is sketchy. However, it's known that the broad base of the breed is English thoroughbred, mixed with various other breeds from South Africa and elsewhere. These lines developed into a breed first known as whalers because they were thought to have been bred in New South Wales. But in fact, they were also bred in most other states of Australia. They were used extensively by the Indian Army and in the First World War by the Australian Light Horse. The Australian Stock Horse has evolved from these horses and many thousands of them are now registered with the Australian Stock Horse Society Limited. ...making of this program were bred on D'Ambra, the property owned by the author of the book, The Thinking Horseman. The D'Ambran horses are of a breed which has been developed on the station for over a hundred years and have been selected for their conformation, sure-footedness, athletic ability and cattle sense. These qualities enable them to make quick turns and make them safe to ride in steep and rugged country. Because of their calm obedience, which has been instilled into them by their Jeffrey Method training, they learn to trust and obey their riders. The Australian stock horse saddles were derived from the English hunting saddle, which was brought to this country by the first settlers almost 200 years ago. The English hunting saddle proved to be inadequate for Australian conditions, and in about 1840, modifications appeared in the form of knee pads and seat rolls. Rings and Ds were added to carry the stockman's equipment, such as coats, blankets, saddlebags, and quart pots for the brewing of tea. Good working stock horses were a most valuable possession for any grazier of a century ago. The Wright family has lived in the New England district for a hundred years now. This property was bought by the author's grandfather Albert Andrew Wright in 1885. He and his wife Charlotte May had a vested interest in the breeding and training of the Australian horse. Horses in those days were used in practically all work around the property, from harvesting to spending weeks out in the back country mustering cattle. Morris's father, Cecil Mackenzie Wright, married in 1908. He took over the northern end of the run and built a house there. Morris was born there and has spent most of his life working horses and cattle. Radium, the horse on the right of this picture, was born in 1918. It is said that he had the greatest influence on the Australian stock horse and nearly all of the D'Ambran horses carry his bloodline. Kel Jeffrey, who Morris met in 1953, was the originator of the Jeffrey method and a man who was passionately committed to what he called a new deal for horses. This is the late Kel B. Jeffrey, 
an Australian who has spent the great bulk of his life amongst horses. After his death at the age of 78 years, Mr. Jeffrey devoted a great deal of his time to demonstrating his revolutionary methods of handling and teaching unbroken horses. It was in that year, 33 years ago, that Morris Wright attended a demonstration where old Kell, in his late 70s, was displaying his incredible technique. Morris, like everyone else, was sceptical, but when he tried it for himself and found that it worked, he came to believe that what the old man was pushing was not only a new deal for horses, but also a new deal for people. And the filly stands curious, yet calm, facing her teacher, ready for her first lesson. He pulls sharply on the rope. People for over 2,000 years have been literally breaking horses and in many instances being themselves broken both physically and mentally. This demonstrates a more drastic form of the whole, yet without cruelty is sufficient to prove to the horse that man is her master. At this juncture there is no control whatsoever over the horse and if it should move about it's important that no attempt be made to drop to the ground until the horse has voluntarily come to a halt. Otherwise, she would think that her tutor was forced off by moving. Geoffrey, a professional journalist and newspaper proprietor, was not really a skilled rider and therefore not considered to be an authority on horses. It was the professional horsemen and breakers who confronted him head on and bitterly opposed his methods, fearing that their own systems were being undermined. After 40 years of commitment, Kel Geoffrey died without ever seeing his system universally accepted. He passed away in 1954 in relative obscurity. Beginning at the bumping of the horse is another version of the advance and retreat method. Kel Jeffrey's system of training horses became as controversial as it was unique. He believed that to break an animal's spirit and force it to cooperate out of a sense of fear was no way to establish a working relationship with it. He maintained that every untamed horse, or any other animal for that matter, has an area around it which one may not enter without causing the animal to react, sometimes violently. This philosophy must be borne in mind by the rider trainer right throughout the horse's life, because too much pressure from the rider can in the same way result in a violent reaction from the horse, and to know how much pressure to apply can be hard to gauge. Thousands of people have now used this gentle system to effectively communicate with their horses. For those of you who are familiar with the first program in this series, the Jeffrey Method of Horse Handling, you'll no doubt be familiar with the gentleman sitting next to me, Mr. Morris Wright. Morris, the Jeffrey method of horse handling has uh, taken root successfully practically all around the world now. What's prompted you to produce this second program? Well, Paul, when I wrote the book, The Thinking Horseman, which was really a sequel to the Jeffrey method of horse handling, the first book I wrote, I realised that we'd only told half the story and that the Jeffrey method applied not only to the unbroken horse in its, uh, in its first training, but it also, of course, applied to the further training of the young horse, and in fact, applies to horses right throughout their working life. The system used in the thinking horseman uh, using the Jeffrey method can be applied to uh, horses that have uh, previously been trained? Yes, it can, but of course, it's much more effective if it's uh, just a continuation of the Jeffrey Method system right throughout its life. And it applies to uh, horses, uh, I suppose, uh, no matter what their eventual occupation becomes. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's so. The, uh, the thinking horseman really is, is, uh, brings the horse up to the stage where he can be then put into specialised training like dressage camp drafting, polo, or any of those uh, specialised uh, sports or purposes for which horses are, are used these days. Well, in the basic training of a young horse, Morris, 
Do you find that the equipment used is important? Yes, the equipment is important, especially from the point of view of comfort for both horse and rider. You can't expect a horse to perform properly if he's uncomfortable. And uh, the same applies to the rider. But of course the rider can very often do something about it, whereas the horse can't. How about bridles, Morris? Any particular preference for any kind or type of bridle? We're not really fussy about the style so much, Paul. We're concerned with the safety and providing the bridle is made out of a good strong material, preferably of leather, and we, uh, we want to see it fitting well around the head and ears. This is a conventional Australian stock bridle fitted with brass buckles, throat strap and leather reins. As far as bits are concerned, we prefer a jointed snaffle. With the take and give system on the rein, the snaffle bit can be most effective. The discomfort inflicted on the horse's mouth by the bit is not necessarily enough in itself to stop or turn the horse. The bit here is a cheek bar snaffle, which is very functional. The bit can be seen to assist in pulling the horse's head around when one rein only is applied. The horse must be educated to realize that the pressure will be relieved when he responds to the aid. This bit is an egg butt jointed snaffle of stainless steel. Note the chin strap attachment, which helps to keep the bit in place when one rein is pulled. We feel that a jointed snaffle is readily accepted by most horses. It is important for this bit to be short in the mouthpiece to prevent a soaring effect. We find a cob-sized bit fits most saddle horses. Regular checks on bits should be made in the interest of safety. Flaking nickel plate can cut a horse's mouth. Morris, how do you feel about the use of the curb bit? There's no doubt about it, curb bits are very effective in the right hands, but incorrectly used, they're very severe on a horse's mouth. This one, a working type American curb bit, not widely used in Australia and seldom seen on an Australian stock horse here. Note the leverage effect when the reins are pulled. Morris, I've noticed that you use drop nose bands on some of the horses that you're training here. We use these drop nose bands to prevent the horse from opening his mouth. A horse can evade the bit by opening his mouth, which reduces the bit's effectiveness and the rider's control. The adjustment is important. One or two fingers under the chin is the gauge. The nose band should not be low enough to restrict the horse's breathing. Under what circumstances would you use a bosal, Morris? A bosal requires special rider expertise and can be very effective on a hard-mouthed horse. Some horses work better from the nose and the mouth. Note the reins are attached under the chin at one central point. I believe there are several types of bosals in use. Yes, this is what we call a Kelly bosal, which has the advantage of sliding reins to assist when turning the horse. It is an Australian version of the bosal which is used in the United States. A hackamore bit is a more severe type of bosal. With its leverage effect, it can exert great pressure on the nose of the horse and needs to be handled with care. A padded saddle cloth can be filled with foam plastic or curled horsehair and covered with woolen saddle kersey or some other material. This wool single saddle blanket 
is normally used with an Australian stock saddle. This is the dual purpose English or continental saddle that can be used for both hacking or jumping. The sheepskin pad is a useful addition. With the increased popularity of western riding, this traditional American saddle is being widely used now in Australia. It has a padded seat and features comfortable oxbow stirrups. This is a handmade Australian stock saddle with metal oxbow stirrups attached. Note the slight similarity to the English saddle from which it was derived many years ago. The knee pads, deep seat and high cantle give comfort and security to the rider. On mounting, Michael briefly demonstrates the old-time backward or armchair seat before assuming his normal upright position. We prefer the latter, of course, because it enables the rider to use the leg aids effectively. The girth is of nylon cotton weave, very strong and durable. Its softness ensures comfort for the horse. Oxbow stirrups are popular these days because of their strength and comfort. These four bar stirrup arms were popular on stations with stockmen before the advent of oxbow type. This is an old style safety stirrup with a curve on the outside section which allows the rider's boot to be released in the event of an accident. Spurs are a valuable aid, but their purpose is often misunderstood. To simply jab the horse with a spur only makes him flinch. If the spur is held on, the horse will move away from it. This pressure should be released immediately the response is felt. These old-fashioned spurs with a sharp roll are too severe and not recommended. This is a training or working spur for stock work and competition and favoured by us for its blunt free spinning rolls. I've also noticed, Morris, that some of the horses on Deambran have cruppers attached to their saddles. Why is this? Well, the reason is that we do quite a lot of work with our horses in steep country. The function of the crupper is obviously to help keep the saddle in place and even if the horse has a good high wither, the crupper will help to take the pressure from the shoulders of the horse when going down a steep hill. The gauge of its tightness is four fingers as shown on the highest part of the horse's rump. A crupper attachment is standard on all Australian stock saddles. Well, basically, that's all the equipment we need in the training of a young horse. And Michael's probably got Ivy and her mob in the yard over there. We'll go and see how he's getting on. OK, good. The previous program, the Jeffrey method of horse handling, shows how over a period of 75 minutes we see Ivy, the blue roan two-year-old Australian stock horse filly, being put through the Jeffrey system by Michael Wright. She was taken from her free range environment, handled, saddled and ridden, all in a matter of approximately two hours. The following day, she was ridden bareback and under saddle, taught to move off, stop and turn with the rider on her back. We now see in the thinking horseman 
the continuation of this process. Michael is riding Diambran Winston, a registered Australian stock horse stallion, whose breeding can be traced back 100 years to Eclipse, a thoroughbred stallion bought by my grandfather in 1885 when he first acquired this land. Winston has no less than five strains of radium blood in his pedigree. Ivy's mob consists of 10, three and four year old Australian stock horses, bred and broken in at the Ambrin. They are at different stages of their training. As before, she is drafted again from her mates, but it is a different story now, as can be seen from this flashback of her first introduction to isolation. Ivy is brought back into the yard after her spell of some weeks on good pasture. She has developed, put on a little weight, and her coat has changed slightly in colour. She is put back into the squeeze crush, and she is quite relaxed and content to let Michael walk up to her. As pointed out in the previous program, the squeeze crush is not essential. However, its use does save time, especially when handling a nervous and highly strung young horse. When offered feed, she allows herself to be caught and the first thing that Michael does is put the control rope around her neck. This reminds her that she must be prepared to obey and respect the pull if it comes. She should relax and allow herself to be handled. Michael can see that she is happy, so he proceeds to mount in the same way as before, over the withers. He can also see that she still has her docile, friendly attitude towards him, and she doesn't appear to have forgotten their previous close relationship. However, if any fear or resistance is apparent, the golden rule of advance and retreat must be observed. And in the case of a more timid horse than this one, it must be used continuously until the horse is completely relaxed. This means that the handler must retrace his steps. Ivy accepts the bridle as a matter of course.
It's a different story to when that saddle went on the first time a while ago, isn't it? it certainly is. As can be seen in this flashback from the Jeffrey Method program, Ivy shows considerable indignation and resentment to the saddle. When doing up the girth, he is cautious to take great care not to pinch her. The girth should not be too tight at first until she has moved a few steps and then it can be taken up another hole or two if necessary. If she is quite relaxed and shows no sign of humping her back, Michael can now proceed to mount without using the stirrups as before. If, however, she is unhappy with the girth and saddle, she should be led around the yard until she is moving along freely. Michael remembers her performance the first time he saddled her, as shown in this last flashback. So he must be mindful of this side of her character right throughout her training. Note that Michael is still using the short neck rope to help when leading her and to give him more control when in the saddle, as on the occasion when she was first ridden. This procedure is recommended when young horses are brought in after spelling as a general rule especially if they are of a breed that wants to buck and if they are nervous or highly strung. The coacher horse can also be a help here. Most horse people will be aware of the potential behaviour of their horses when they are brought in for work after a spell. With the Jeffrey Method horses, though, we find that in general they behave as before and often show even less resistance or fear to their rider or handler than when they were last ridden. The reason for this is that they have happy memories of their previous association with their rider. Unlike our old-style rough broken horses, In this case, Ivy doesn't show any sign of resistance or girthiness, so Michael carries on from where he left off. Well, she seems to be going pretty well in the yard here. I think we can get Michael to take her into the arena and give her a bit of basic training. Ivy has now come to the stage of her training where more pressure has to be exerted on her if she is going to become a well-trained saddle horse. We use the coacher horse for the transition from the yard to the arena. Note that the neck rope has been replaced by the running martingale. Because she is happy to be in Michael's company and also she doesn't present the saddle or girth, she should move off more freely than before. She must be ridden in such a way that she doesn't become antagonised 
time must be allowed for her to absorb the lesson. To assert his authority, Michael turns her back into the yard again. As like most young horses, she would prefer to go out towards the wide open spaces. Always we use the advance and retreat system and the young horse must be taught to obey the rider and accept authority. In this way, Ivy will learn to become a happy horse under saddle. She and the coacher horse go into the arena and together they do one circuit. Then she is on her own. The most important thing now is to try and establish a good mouth and this must be done before too much advanced training is attempted. Position of the horse's head is the most important factor to start with. So having positioned it initially with the running rein, we use the running martingale to teach her to move with her head correctly held. The horse should be light and responsive to the rein and obey the diagonal aids. Care must be taken not to overbend the young horse by excessive use of the martingale. This is her first lesson in halting. Michael heads her straight for the corner, sits down hard in the saddle, closes his legs and eases back on the reins. The rider must try to cultivate light, responsive hands, which recognize any sign of giving on the part of the horse, for which an immediate reward or release of the rein pressure should be made. In this way, the horse will learn to obey the slightest touch or pressure on the rein. Michael dismounts and removes the rings from the reins in preparation for the next exercise in suppling Ivy's neck muscles. He ties her head around to the girth First one side, then the other. This teaches her to give her head and corrects any tendency she may have to be predominantly one-sided. She should be left alone, tied on the stiff side, until the fault has been corrected. Michael is now going to carry a small riding crop which he will use if necessary behind his leg to reinforce the leg aids. To help with the mouthing process, Michael mounts. He pulls her head around to the left side and rubs her forehead. She likes this and it has a soothing effect. Then he does the same on the right side. Just before we go on with the basic training, let's go through the diagonal aids as mentioned in the Jeffrey method of horse handling. Michael now demonstrates the diagonal aids, inside rein and outside leg, first to the right and then to the left. 
He exaggerates these movements so that they can be clearly seen. Here, the forces which Michael exerts on Ivy diagonally propel her forward and to the left, and then to the right and forward. These diagonal aids are the natural aids to which a horse will respond. Now he achieves a slow trot, then a half halt by sitting down in the saddle, closing his legs slightly and exerting a little pressure on the reins. Walk on. Turn left. Now a halt and back up two steps. Aids to halt are as before and an extension of these aids produce a back up. Turn left. Push with seat and legs, relax reins a little, half halt again. Trot left and sitting on outside diagonal and taking a little left rein, push with legs and seat to canter left. Half halt. Trot on and halt. Back up. Trot left. Circle right. Trotting circle left. Halt. Back up two steps. Walk on, halt, back. Michael jiggles the reins as a signal for an impending halt. Knowing that horses are nearly always right and left handed, a thinking horseman should realize this tendency early on and compensate for it by paying more attention to the weaker side. However, he should be aware that this side could become sore if overworked. As suppleness improves, this schooling can be made more equal on both sides. It must be remembered that training a young horse is a very gradual thing and they have to have plenty of rest breaks. I think we might let Ivy go now and Michael can take her down and put her out with her mates. As Michael leads Ivy along, he uses the crop to make her lead up level with him so that she learns to parade as she should in a lead or halter class. She joins her mates and can now feed and relax until the next lesson, which may be tomorrow, the next day, or even in a week's time. It doesn't seem to matter. 
As long as her recollections of the previous day's activities are comparatively pleasant ones, this of course is not the case when rough breaking or handling methods have been used, when fear and discomfort is part and parcel of the process. Ivy has had her first rest break and the next morning she comes back into the arena fresh and free of stress, happy to get on with the job. The training of horses is one thing, but teaching people how to do it is something else. The problem that most people have is lack of patience. We must be careful not to give her too much work in one session because if she becomes tired and sore, she will start to resist the rider's aids. Many people can learn how to train a horse, but it takes experience to know when to stop. This lesson will consist of walking, trotting and cantering in circles, with the emphasis on the canter with a change of leg or lead. Remembering that horses are like people, right or left-handed, and some are ambidextrous. Note in this slow motion scene how Michael, in a rising trot, sits on the outside diagonal to produce a canter left. Flying changes should be left until later and Michael is happy to have her do simple changes, which she seems to be managing quite well, considering her inexperience. This is very strenuous work for her, and Michael must be on the lookout for signs of fatigue. We use this exercise for suppling up and for the purpose of teaching her to turn in tighter circles and to widen her stride as a prelude to her learning stock horse wheels and rollbacks. It also helps with her mouthing, especially if the horse tends to be stiff on one side, which in fact is the case with most horses at some stage of their early training. The reason for this is not always clear, but in the case of a one-sided horse, this exercise should be repeated on the stiff side. This is the first time out of the arena for Ivy, with a rider on her back, and her mate Diambran Dominic coaches her along and shows her the way. She appreciates the change of scene and moves freely along. It is very important to avoid boring a horse when training, so this is doing her good. Because she has been worked so much in the yard and the arena, she is obeying Michael's signals fairly well. It is vitally important to be sure that the young horse is well under control and obedient to the rider's aids before being shown the open spaces. The most likely thing to go wrong is that she may try to run away with the rider. She has been used to working with the coacher horse, 
so she is happy to follow him along. We're now going to demonstrate the more advanced training of the stock horse. And because the ivy is still very green, we're going to demonstrate this with a, a more experienced stock horse. The training of a cattle horse takes time, but the selection of the right horse is of paramount importance. The first thing to look for is athletic ability and compact conformation, both of which generally go hand in hand. The next thing to look for is cattle sense. And this is something that some horses never develop. It is a trait which is heritable and varies in intensity. It is also possible to have a horse that can be too keen, and this is the one which is likely to become overexcited and blow up. Suppleness and athletic ability are evident in this Australian stock horse mare, the Amberin Soraya. Note her concentration and attention to her rider as she listens with her ears laid back. These limbering up exercises are necessary for better rider control and muscle development of the horse. Diagonal aids are used to great effect in this type of work. In order to quicken pace, Michael assumes a forward seat and exerts a forward impulse. To execute a wheel to the left, he applies left rein and right leg. At the same time, he leans a little to the left and turns his head and shoulders in that direction. For a wheel to the right, these aids are reversed. It must be noted that the greater the pressure with which the aids are applied, especially the outside leg, the tighter the turn will become. In this country, the working stock horse competitions consist of some of this sort of work. And cantering circles at varying speeds with flying changes are essential in suppling up a cattle horse. How long would you say on average it would take, Morris, to get a horse up to this sort of performance level? Oh, it takes quite a long time. It depends a lot on the horse. It depends on the trainability of the horse. Horses are like people, and some are more intelligent than others. When training on cattle, it is important to only work one beast at a time, and the object for the start is to encourage the horse to work the beast of his own accord, and not to interfere too much with his work once he gets the idea. In other words, the rider should avoid cueing the young horse as far as possible. Camp drafting, of course, differs from cutting in this way because when cueing the horse in competition, the camp drafter is not penalised. In fact, of course, it is essential when working outside the yard in a run.
guard work should be the first part of the training of a horse for camp drafting and cutting. And of course the leg aids are very important. Because the yard is where the camp draft competition begins, it is logical that this is where the horse's training should start. Once a horse learns to head a beast off with the help of a fence, where he has the advantage, he should then get the urge to go to its head outside in a run. The trainer should always try to make it easy for the horse to get to the head by working the beast wide. This is what we call doubling, a very good training exercise which two can play and of course it has the effect of training two horses and two riders at the one time. Camp drafting is an all-Australian horse sport. It originated in the cattle mustering camps of this country late in the last century. Competition has developed to some extent as a time event, in so much as the figure of eight and gate course has to be negotiated in a certain time. Points are given for horse work, both in the yard and out on the course. I suppose this kind of training is pretty uh, complicated, Morris. Oh yes, it's very complicated and time consuming. But the best way to demonstrate it is to get Ivy in the arena and we go through it slowly and in detail. Notice how effective the diagonal aids are when opening and shutting gates. In order to initiate a turn to the left on the hocks, Michael applies left rein and holds her quarter steady with his legs, then back again to the right. A turn on the forehand is made through pressure behind the girth with the lower leg. At the same time, the four quarters are held steady with the reins. In training a stock horse, the first thing to do is make sure that it will obey the leg aids so that it can learn to turn effectively on its hocks. This is particularly important with the young horse if it is to be taught rollbacks and stock horse wheels. To assist him here, Michael makes use of the fence to prevent Ivy from moving forward in the turn. This encourages her to use her hocks, but the objective must be to make these turns away from the fence. When introducing a young horse to cattle for the first time, we try to keep on a very low key. However, in camp draft competition, the rider may spend 
up to a minute in selecting his beast. If he is riding an inexperienced horse, he will try to select a docile beast, one that will not put too much pressure on the horse. However, if he is riding his top camp drafter, he may choose to take a wild one, which would give him more opportunity to show off his horse. Michael selects a beast and Ivy moves in to cut it off. We like to see the horse cock at least one ear towards the beast to indicate she is watching it. Whenever the beast moves, Michael asks Ivy to move with it. In this way, she learns to eventually move with it of her own accord. She should face the beast and work head to head with it. Michael keeps her back so as to work wide and make it easier for her to get around the beast. As soon as the pressure comes on, Michael backs off so as to avoid having to ask too much at this early stage of Ivy's training. Now that Ivy has been introduced to cattle, she can now become involved in doing some real cattle work. Riding on a loose rein is an integral part of stock horse training because it relaxes and rewards the horse. A stock horse should do all his steady work on a loose rein. Michael rides her out to meet the mob of cattle and participate in rounding them up and yarding them. Considering this is her first experience in working cattle with other horses as part of a team, she was doing quite well. So she has come the full circle from the day she herself was brought into the yard with her mates to this moment when she participates in yarding up a mob of cattle. This does not mean that Ivy is destined for a career devoted entirely to cattle work, she is at the stage of her life where she could take her place with further training in any of the modern equine pursuits.